video on second order modeling continues with the theme of DC servos. Now, what we've already said is that the DC servo is the main workhorse in many engineering applications and therefore all engineers really need to understand how it works. What we're going to do here is we're going to develop the previous video which showed that the basic model for a DC servo comes out as a second order ODE. But we did make very particular assumptions. So what we're going to do here is look at what happens if we change some of those modeling assumptions. Does it change the model we end up with and therefore the behavior of the DC servo? Now here's a reminder of a basic layout for a DC servo, again using a scale electric car. So you'll see that there's an armature sat inside a magnetic field. And when you put a current through that armature, a torque is generated. Now what happens to that torque? You'll see here very clearly that the torque is supplied through a system of gears to the back wheels. And the key point here is gears. So we're going to look at gears in this video briefly. So what's the model? Now what we did in the previous video, so we're not going to do it here, is we showed with basic assumptions you get these five equations. And if you simplify and rearrange all those equations, you end up with a second order model of the form here. So a basic C DC servo with a flexible shaft has second order dynamics. Now here's the question. What happens if we changed some of the assumptions? So for example, in the previous one, we assumed a very simple electrical circuit with just a resistance and a back EMF. What happens if there are other components in the electric circuit? Now, we're not actually going to discuss that in this particular video, but it's something you might want to consider. Next, we assumed that the shaft supplying the torque to the mechanical part was flexible. It can twist. In practice, you could probably argue that the shaft rotation is insignificant okay, compared to the movement of the load, and therefore this can be ignored. How does that change our modeling? And finally, it's more normal for the servo to be connected to the load via some gearing. So how does that affect our model if we put some gears into the system? First then, let's look at the assumption of a rigid shaft. In other words, we're going to assume that the movement of the motor is approximately the same as the movement of the load. And the key observation here is that we're going to be removing one of the energy storage devices because when we assume that the shaft could twist, we we're assuming it was acting like a spring and therefore it could store energy. And that gave us one of the modes in our second order differential equation. If we remove this component, we're removing one of our energy storage devices. And therefore, we expect to end up with a first order model because now we've only got one energy storage device. OK, now when we assume a rigid shaft, what essentially we're doing is we're saying the inertia is small compared to the stiffness of the shaft. And that's fairly typical. OK, and what we can do is we can derive the model by setting the spring constant for the shaft equal to infinity. And I guess that's an approximation, but it's good enough. Alternatively, you can rework everything from first principles. And we'll do both, but relatively briefly. First then, what happens if I set the spring constant equal to infinity? Well, here's the model we've derived, assuming that the, flat, the shaft was flexible. And now all I'm going to do is wherever I had this capital K, which was the spring constant, I'm going to put in infinity. And of course, what that does is it kills this term and it kills this term. And what do you get left with? You get left with a first order model. OK, so here is a very important observation. A typical DC servo with a simple load can be well approximated by a first order model. OK, and that's important that you know that. So even though we did come up with a second order model that was assuming a flexible shaft, in practice, a rigid shaft assumption is good enough for many, many examples, and therefore the model will be first order. In other words, you get very simple dynamics. The model is between the voltage supplied and the angular velocity. Now, I could have derived that from first principles rather than setting k equal to infinity. And the only difference is you'll see I start with four equations because I no longer have the shaft twist equation. And so 
I'm just going to run through these so you can look at them in your own time if you're really interested. You'll see I eliminate one variable to go from four equations to three. Please pause the video if you want to see exactly what I've done. I then remove an, another variable to go from three equations to two and remove the final variable to end up with my first order ODE. So I've not gone through the steps there because I think you can do that in your own time if you're really interested. Now, the next thing is, what happens if you add some gearing? So that's what this picture is trying to show. You'll see I've got the electrical circuit part over here. And this JM is supposed to represent the inertia of the motor or the armature. So that has a significant inertia in itself, especially if it's spinning very fast. Now, what you remember from the picture of the skeletric car is that at the end of the motor, there is a small gear. And here I'm assuming that that gear has a radius R1. It is then connected to a gear, a different gear, radius R2, which is connected to the load. So this bit down here represents the load. Okay, and this bit over here is the motor. And what we want to do is say, how would I model this scenario? How do I model it when I've added this gearing in to the system? OK, so again, we can be slow and systematic, and you'll see it's not too bad as long as you stay calm. So the first thing to do is model the electrical circuit. So you see I've got voltage supplied equals IR, and here I've added an inductor, so I've got LDIDT plus E. It's not unreasonable to add an inductor given you've got the coil, which essentially has some inductance. Now, I've ignored all these subscripts A um, just to make life a bit easier and I've called that U V. Okay, now the other two equations back EMF equals K omega and torque equals K I. So there's the electrical part. Of course there's a very simple substitution which we'll normally make. We'll get rid of the E straight away by putting it in as K omega M. What about the mechanical equations? So we're going to assume that there's a tangential force F between the two gears. So in other words, gear R1 is driving gear R2 and the way it does it, it exerts a tangential force upon it. Now, what is the equation for torque? You'll notice that torque is force times perpendicular distance. So in effect, the torque on gear 1 is F times R1 because that's the radius. But the torque on gear 2 is F times R2 because that's the radius on gear two. So there's an interesting observation here. Even though they've got the same force between them, and they have to have, the effective torque is different. And of course, that's the whole point of gearing, or one of the points of gearing. Now, what we're going to do next is do a torque balance for each mechanical part of this system. So first, let's look at the motor part. You'll see we've got the torque supplied from the motor, torque equals Ki. And what does this torque do? It accelerates the armature. So there you've got Jm times d omega m dt. So that's the inertia of the armature times the acceleration of the armature plus the torque supplied at the gear, which is F times R1. OK, what about the load, which I've done in this purple circle? Well, you'll see the torque supplied to the load is F times R2. And what does this torque do? It drives the load inertia and the load friction. And a final observation is the gears, where they meet, they have to have the same velocity from continuity. Hopefully that's obvious because the teeth are meshed together anyway. So what does this tell us? It tells us that R1 times omega m must be the same as R2 times omega l. In other words, the gears are spinning at different angular velocities. So what we've got to do now is say, how can we combine all these equations? So first, let's write down all the equations we've just got. And you'll see there's quite a few of them, more than we had in the previous video. First, with the electrical one, what I can do is I'm going to get rid of this omega m. And the re way I'm going to get rid of it is I'm going to substitute in from this equation down at the bottom. So you'll see what I've got now is k times r2 omega l over R1. 
What about this equation here? What I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the torque supplied from the motor by just writing it as Ki. What about this next one? Again, I'm going to get rid of the torque by writing it as FR2. And so you'll see the F's here, and I've divided through by R2 on the other side. Now, this last one here, I'm going to do something a bit nifty. What I'm going to do is take the F from this equation, and I'm going to put it in here. OK, so you'll see where I've got F times R1 in that second equation. If you close this brackets here, you'll see there's R1 outside the brackets. And what's inside this brackets here is, in fact, just this term here. All right, so what have we got left with? We've now reduced it to two equations, these two equations here. And now what we want to do is get rid of current. You might say, oh, this is beginning to get a bit messy, but you'll notice I can write current explicitly using this right-hand equation here because it's just got Ki. So all I need to do is take the I from here and substitute it in there and in there, and then I will have got rid of I. The other thing I'm going to do to make life a bit simpler is I'm going to say let the ratio of the radii of the uh, gears, R2 over R1, be N. So having done that, and I'm not going to sit and dwell on these details because you can pause the video if you need to and look through the steps much more slowly. That's within your power. So first of all, let's look at this IR term. And you'll see there's the R. This K has come from this K over here because I've got to divide by K. And then you'll notice what's in the brackets here is what we had here. OK, so we just substituted in I, as we said. Next, we had an L di dt term. So again, you'll see I've got L over K, the L from, from here, the K from here. And then I've got d dt, because it was di dt. And again, you'll see in this brackets, it's just the I term. And then at the end, we've just added that. So again, you'll see there's no tricks. All we've done is a direct substitution of this I from the right-hand side into the left-hand side. But yes, the equation does look rather messy. And then if I rearrange it and simplify it, etc., etc., you get something like that. And here's our final model. Now, I have done that rather fast because you can pause the video if you want to go through the steps yourself. But here's the key point. Again, you will see, as noted in the previous video, that these methods of writing down all the equations from first principles and then combining them together to get an ODE are becoming very cumbersome. And I would recommend you look at more advanced modeling approaches in order to handle scenarios like this and the more complex scenarios that may be coming. So some conclusions. What we've done in this video is we've done a basic development of a DC server model by showing how some changes in assumptions lead to different models. Now, the most common example is to assume a rigid shaft. And we've shown that this gives you a first order model. And in fact, that's very, very common. And first order dynamics are quite a good observation, where you just have a simple load and a simple friction. We've also looked at the impact of adding a gear. And what you'll notice is if you put gearing on the end, the modeling is beginning to become quite complex. Now, there are other assumptions, and we've not looked at those and really we would suggest if you need to, you should be skilled enough to look at those yourself.